I just find it, I really, really rely on language um, and material. And those are two things that I feel like are like the baseline for both of those mediums, installation and book arts. And installation, um, I, and in books, um, I use sensory tactics. I am obsessed with using smell. Um, in one of my most recent installations, I used a uh, Stockholm tar, um, which I love that smell so much. And I think what I love about that smell and using smell in general, which I find harder to do in other mediums, is it can be used as a trigger for memory, I think. Um, and I think it makes telling a story, it removes for me some of those challenges that I confront with like authorship and ownership because it puts, um, it puts out the opportunity for people to tell their own story if they kind of are tracing their own memory um, through a smell. And so the Stockholm car was really strong. Um, the last time I showed it was in a huge convention center. I was all the way in the back of the convention center. And when you walked in at the front, you could smell the tar. Um, and some people hated it, and some people loved it. it. Some people thought it smelled like a factory. Some people thought it smelled like a barn. Other people thought it smelled like tar. Some people fought with me, claiming that is not tar. Um, so I, it just evokes a reaction. And I think that that's wonderful. And I want people to be engaged in stories and histories without having to um, become an educator. And I think sensory tactics give you that opportunity, even in an installation having all this milkweed that's in buckets right now um, on the floor underfoot. So when you walk along, it crunches and you feel it and that has a sound and a feeling. Um, and same with paper, the way it feels, the way it smells. I've tried to um, imbue paper with the smells of vanilla and ginger and peanut right now. Um, and so these kind of like sensorial tactics are harder, at least for me, um, to have in other mediums and I think also make up for the lack of kind of like visual narrative that I tend to like keep out of a lot of my work. I think usually the only like visual information I use at least recently has been um, like family archives um, and photography. Um, yeah, or somehow kind of um, collaging in like a very atmospheric and three-dimensional way like found objects um, that I think carry meaning. So, again, trying to tell a story through material and not language, or telling a story through um, limited language and the sensorial. I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Such a, such a question I feel like I'm asked often that I always feel shockingly stumped. Um, and maybe it's hard to answer or feel like I'm there because the a lot of the um, like um, confidence and like love for art making was a product of other artists that I got to spend time with. I was very lucky that as a young person, like all of my first jobs were working with like local artists in my like small suburban outside of Philadelphia town, um, and I I just feel like oh no, like I'm I'm not as like hardworking and committed and driven and intelligent is like, Harshita, not yet, I'm not there yet. Um, so I think maybe that is playing into that reticence. Um, but, hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> um, someone who's, who I look to a lot is Adrienne Piper, I love Adrienne Piper. Um, especially thinking about using language. Um, she's been a huge influence. I think, obviously, like every artist, we function a little differently, um, but still someone I look to for inspiration and thinking about how to use language in art. Um, um, Betty Saar, Alison Saar, um, mother and daughter, probably two of my favorite artists of all time. I, um, I just, I really, really value and feel attracted to work that I just think is smart um, and makes me think and makes me question myself and ideas that I have. And who knows if that's the intention or um, what it's trying to do, but when it does that, it's something that is really stimulating and exciting um, for me. Um, I also love um, poetry, so that is an avenue that I find myself finding inspiration in as well. Um, but 
Yeah, there are a lot of artists that I love, and I I really enjoy um, teaching, and I try to always have like a little like class library of my small artist like kind of um, retrospective or um, gallery show or whatever you want to call them um, books for students to access and kind of use as a starting point. So I'm definitely not doing all of the artists that influence me justice by not saying their names, but there are. Um, I think the biggest thing I've learned about myself pretty recently is that I'm a writer. I've always, just as I've always made art, I've always um, written. And I'll never forget being in a, it was one of my final crits of my first year of grad school. And we were all sitting in this really small curtain room and I was showing work that was just one really long scroll um, of text. And then I had another book hanging from the ceiling. Not important at the end of the scroll, and that was all I was showing for crit um, was text. And we're talking, we're talking, and I said something like, "Oh, well, like I'm not a writer, so like I couldn't say like X Y. I couldn't give you that. Um, I can't really answer that question because I'm not a writer." And every single person in the room goes, "Hey!" <laughs> um, and I was like, "Oh, got it. I'm." I'm a, I'm a writer. Um, so I definitely think that that's something that I learned that I didn't realize. Um, also then I guess that, um, that kind of news flash was also learning something more big picture that I think I can be pretty hard on myself and don't, and like we all are, and don't acknowledge like, hey, I'm good at this thing. And so like, yeah, like, okay, like I'm doing that thing. <laughs> so that is something um, that I've learned trying to do a little better at um, owning the things that I enjoy doing. Yeah, um, I think, mm, I think like a lot of artists, at least a lot of people I talk to, as much as like, I love to make. I think you're often like confronted with this like, but what do I make kind of question, right? Um, and I feel very lucky I haven't felt that way in a really long time. I'm at a point right now where I feel like almost overwhelmed. Um, like there's so, there's so much to make, um, which is really exciting and I feel incredibly grateful for that feeling. Um, but I think the reason I feel that way is because there are so many stories that I just don't know, like about myself and my family. And so that's where it started with this idea of oral histories, specifically black oral histories. And um, it all really, really started. My um, grandfather died like within like the past five years and he um, grew up on this farm in North Carolina where these peanuts come from um, and came to Pennsylvania and has this amazing story. Um, and once he retired, he kind of became this kind of self-proclaimed historian of our small town, which has this history with the Underground Railroad. Um, and he would go to the public schools uh, month by month, every year, and tell them about the history of the Underground Railroad in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and he basically created his own archive of history, and not just about Bucks County and the Underground Railroad, but about trying to find out about his family history in North Carolina. He loved North Carolina, went back every summer, um, and when he passed away, I, a year later I was with my grandma and I got, I was going, just helping her go through some things and I was like, can I take this stuff? And she was like, all of this paperwork and newspaper clippings and like boxes and boxes of pop-offs like writing that I've never looked at in my life. Yes, you could absolutely take it. Um, and I did. And that totally started the, um, Kind of immersion in oral history um, and black oral history is trying to um, I think at first it kind of started as like trying to like piece things together or like finish a story and that's when I realized I feel like I keep saying um, generally I keep saying like nonlinear narratives and that is because I think when I first started like this journey with all of this information that I got from him it was like oh I'm trying to like finish what he started or I'm trying to like piece something together 
Um, and like that's so not true. Like it's okay if things don't have answers and oral histories are notorious for having holes and jumping from here and then 20 years later. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. And I think that's just as valuable as um, a history with holes um, or a history um, written by an oppressor that you learn about in school. And so I'm trying to have the way I write reflect that respect and value of a nonlinear narrative um, for that reason. because this is definitely the first time I've worked with uh, oral histories or stories or history in general uh, that I don't feel a personal connection to. And for so many reasons that's challenging. It's challenging because I'm only in Minnesota for five and a half weeks. Um, and that is absolutely not enough time to feel like you have a confident grasp of a history, let alone a connection to it. Um, and I really hate this idea of like doing the residency and coming to the place and like kind of like sucking the place dry and then like taking and taking more than you're giving. And um, that's still not to say that I feel like I've figured out a way to remedy that, but I'm trying to be as aware of that as possible. Um, and so one of my strategies to try to kind of um, feel like I'm both respecting the history and trying to um, highlight it at the same time um, is trying to find parallels to the narratives I do know and the narratives that I do feel a connection to because um, I do think that there are so many common links um, escape survival travel um, on and on and on and one of the common links I found is water um, and a big thing I was focusing on in the oral histories and continue to focus on um, is this kind of escape story that I learned about, about my grandfather's grandfather and his brother um, escaping through the Okanichunek um, River in North Carolina and leading them to the Great Dismal Swamp, which is a northern colony um, that spans North Carolina and Virginia. Um, and so that is a link that I've really um, felt a connection with, this idea of um, water being a place both of safety, like extreme safety, like this can take me somewhere. Um, and of course, the exact opposite. Um, water is terrifying. Water is dangerous. Water can sweep you up and the next thing you know, you're underneath it and you have no control. Um, and so that contradiction and that um, like tension is a parallel that I'm trying to work from um, here. Um, also using material as a way to kind of make a connection and tell a story. So the Peanuts are uh, from Brady County in North Carolina. Um, using milkweed, which was forest uh, forage in New England, which is where I've been living um, since I was 18. Um, and then using abaca, which is a very um, kind of um, benign fiber in terms of it being um, at least in the paper making world, like readily available and um, used by many people and not necessarily specific to a certain um, narrative, I guess you could say. Um, and for me, like even though the peanuts come from an installation about um, this oral history in North Carolina at this family farm, they also remind me of like colors I see along the Mississippi and textures. Um, and they also make sounds like this um, This one paper, which is milkweed um, embedded in uh, Attica sheets. I think that it's rattle and it's sound. Um, it's placed behind a paper, a, a story or a, a note about um, Dred Scott. Um, and before a note about the pilgrims who fled. Um, and so the sound to me, I think helps spread that story and also and I'm relying on the like material that I have a history with since I've been using it for quite a while now. Um, so that is one way I'm trying to like navigate that kind of like discomfort I have or fear I have or concern I have or pattern that I see happen. Um, but the story itself comes from the um, 
history of the Minnesota Pilgrims, a group of people who um, uh, were spread across two um, plantations. Um, the father, who was a reverend, um, and his children were on a different plantation. Um, he went in the night, he gathered everyone, he went to Missouri and they built a raft. They got on the Mississippi, and it's from the histories I've read, it's incredible that they even got as far as they did on this kind of like ill-made raft. Um, they were stopped by a steamship, and steamships often would stop um, en enslaved people who were trying to kind of row to, to freedom in the north. Um, and they would offer them kind of like shelter and warmth and food and a ride. Um, but oftentimes when they got bored, they were held captive and taken down south and resold into slavery. Um, but this family was stopped by a boat that didn't do that and took them north. Um, they got to Minneapolis and they weren't um, able to get off the ship because uh, everyone working on the docks um, was um, rioting and exhibiting violence, they, uh, racialized violence, and didn't want them here. So they go to St. Paul, but um, they, there were people there. Um, and they started this congregation. And there were about two or three other small congregations, as I understand it, there at the time when they came. Um, but Pilgrim Baptist Church is the one that's still standing. Um, it also took him 13 years to become an ordained minister. Um, so it's like he finally comes here, he's finally free, he's been a reverend all this time, and now he can't marry his people, he can't baptize his people. Um, but it, he did it, and it happened. Um, but it also has been like amazing, and heart-wrenching going through this history and um, like thinking about them not being able to get off the ship at the docks um, and how like the narrative that I read about in these oral histories is exactly the narrative you hear for racist people today. I'm afraid that they're going to take our jobs. We know that they're violent. Like all of these stories that are so tired and so not true. Um, so that's the other challenge of kind of mining through this history is you see so many um, and we all know this, um, you see so many patterns. Um, so that is that story and that history is the origin point for um, the things that I'm working on here, but I don't explicitly tell that story. Um, and that's kind of the balance I'm talking about, of trying to respect the history and not neuter it to the point that I'm just kind of talking, um, but also acknowledging like my authorship and ownership and doing my best to um, tell it in a way um, that feels authentic um, to me. Um, and then I have been doing my best to kind of get out into the landscape um, and explore the Mississippi. That's another method I've been trying to use um, to feel like I have a little bit of um, personal insights into this like river and place that I'm talking about. Um, so when I go and I visit and I go to these different places along the river, I try to write a story or a poem or a reflection. Um, and that is going to be a part of a um, series of um, like poetry chat books that aren't as fine. They won't be made on handy paper. Um, they'll be very basic with a template that we've uh, stitched, printed with polymer instead of handset type. Um, that will give more insights um, into both my experience like along the upper Mississippi um, and more reflections on that specific origin story. Um, it's been amazing. I it's I still feel like it's so like shocking and exciting that in five weeks I'm able to make three artist books and a series of chat books and maybe if I can get my timing right also maybe even a zine that's a little more didactic about the history itself um, and that wouldn't happen if I didn't have the space or the support or the facilities um, and I came here and I didn't even realize I was going to have private studio space so I just feel like so unbelievably spoiled and I feel like this work um, would have happened even without it so the thought that I have it is I still can't believe it um, to be able to act, have access to a press whenever I want it or need it. Um, two paper making studios, um, beautiful beaters, incredibly kind people who always offer to teach me something or um, 
the best way to use this or use this outlet instead of that one and this is the trick to that thing like it's incredible um so the experience has been wonderful and i don't think the work um would have happened and i don't think i would feel as excited and confident in it as i do if i didn't have like this space to do it and it also gave me the space the first opportunity to um work with a um, a history outside of kind of my comfort zone. I don't know when I would have been able to have that um, opportunity otherwise. So like it's a great just kind of learning experience for my practice, um, which is I'm really grateful for.